This video is brought to you by Aura, the best online privacy tool. Hi guys, welcome to a Mushroom Chemistry. So in today's video I decided to try turning some good old baking soda into the incredibly reactive and dangerous elemental sodium and to make it even more interesting, this will all be possible through the use of eggs. For those who don't know, elemental sodium is this very soft, light and shiny metal that is so reactive that it explodes in contact with water and can spontaneously catch on fire. Baking soda and eggs on the other hand are just some random cooking ingredients which as you probably know aren't too reactive or dangerous. It is hard to find even a single connection between them and some dangerous flammable metal but since the chemical world is often really weirdly connected, on paper it seems theoretically possible. You see, baking soda or in other words sodium bicarbonate actually consists of a good amount of sodium but it is in the form of something called an ion and this makes it really happy with its energy state, meaning that it will have a very hard time turning into the free metal, which on the other hand is really unhappy with its existence and wants to destroy itself at all costs. Fortunately, there seems to exist a quite challenging way to turn one into the other using some really interesting reactions and conversions, the first of which is turning baking soda into a chemical called sodium hydroxide. It is also a household commodity often present in drain opener as lye, it is really corrosive and dangerous and I like to imagine it as the middle level of reactivity of sodium compared to baking soda and the free metal. I could actually just easily buy it like a normal and sane person but since I am not either I decided to spice things up and make it myself. Just as a disclaimer though, this procedure will be completely and utterly impractical but it's a cool demonstration of how chemistry works and what's possible to make with household materials. It should also be rather fun and since this is one of the main points of doing amateur chemistry, I'm up for the challenge. Anyway, as the first step of making sodium hydroxide from sodium bicarbonate, I have to remove the bi from it, or in other words convert it into sodium carbonate, often called washing soda. These two chemicals really only slightly differ from one another and since this is the first level of reactivity, the reactions are quite straightforward. All I will have to do is just heat the baking soda to a high temperature and to start I brought this chunky 1kg back of it from an online supplier. It looks like you would expect baking soda to look. To start the conversion I first weighed out 320 grams of it in a beaker which I calculated to be roughly enough for what I have planned. I then got everything onto a hot plate and cranked up the heating. At first it didn't really look like much was happening but when the baking soda got to temperature, some water vapor started to appear. The reaction going on here is just a simple thermal decomposition of sodium bicarbonate into sodium carbonate, water and carbon dioxide, the last two of which escape as gases, leaving behind my product. I continued heating the beaker until it looked like the reaction had finished. The baking soda now turned into this solid and weirdly hard brick, however unfortunately its weight was higher than it should, meaning that the reaction was not quite done yet. To fix this I had to again heat this stuff up and since I was slowly running out of patience, instead of a fragile beaker and some small hot plate, I went all in and used this metal pot along with my good old electric stove. This time I cooked this thing up real hard, now it no longer was some hard mess but a nice and fluffy powder that weighed almost exactly how much it should, meaning that I successfully made some sodium carbonate from baking soda. Now before proceeding further, I would really like to tell you about Aura, the sponsor of today's video. You see, with you just being online, a ton of data brokers sell your private information like your full name, home address and health records to scammers, which if you ask me is really not cool. For example, here is a data search of my US cousin and as you can see quite a lot of his personal information got leaked and he really wasn't too happy about it when I showed it to him. That's why for a while now he and I have been using Aura which is an amazing way to manage our whole online presence and quickly informs us about any suspicious activity and when it detects it, Aura quickly does everything to get the sensitive information of the internet. There are tons of data breaches that you might not even be aware of. For example, AT&T recently revealed over 73 million records from both existing and former customers onto the dark web and it would be a pain to even try to manage this yourself. At the same time, Aura does all this hard work for you, keeping you safe and secure. Aura is undoubtedly the best way to keep your privacy on the internet. You can go to aura.com slash amateurchemistry to start your two-week completely free trial and I already included the link in the description.
Anyway, now for the second step in making sodium, I have to convert my sodium carbonate into the more reactive and dangerous sodium hydroxide and this is where things become a little tricky. The classical way of producing sodium hydroxide would be to convert my sodium carbonate to sodium chloride and then electrolyze it in water which while rather simple would probably be a pain to set up and have an incredibly low yield. After some digging I found a rather obscure and really old method that fits incredibly well into the scope of this video and that's something called caustification. It involves reacting sodium carbonate with a chemical called calcium hydroxide the products of this reaction are my precious sodium hydroxide and calcium carbonate which is incredibly insoluble in water and it's what drives this reaction forward. The reason why I chose this method is because calcium hydroxide is something I can reasonably make unlike trying to set up some dark magic powered electrolyzer. There are quite a few ways of making calcium hydroxide but by far the most accessible one I came across is the one starting from the almighty egg. As you might know an egg's shell is mainly composed of calcium carbonate which through some chemistry magic can be turned into my desired calcium hydroxide. Except for in eggs calcium carbonate can also be found in some rocks or seashells but I think that eggs are by far the most accessible source and just why let the almighty chicken calcium machine go to waste. To get the amount of eggshells needed I forced my whole family to eat literally hundreds of eggs and collect their shells which took a few months but in the end I was now in possession of this rather large bag of crushed and dried eggshells weighing about a kilo which if you think about it is just a stupendously large offering made by chickens to the chemistry gods. Anyway now with my calcium carbonate ready I have to incinerate it at some really high temperatures in order to convert it into carbon dioxide and calcium oxide required to make the calcium hydroxide but before I put the shells into a furnace I need to grind them up a little. To do that I borrowed my parents thermomix and really beat those eggshells with it. They ended up looking like some coarse sand and gave off this nasty egg dust which got everywhere and probably wasn't the best thing to breathe. I got the eggshell powder into a ziploc bag and transported it to my other furnace containing lab. Now for the incineration step I wasn't sure exactly how I should carry it out but after some thinking I figured I would just load the eggshell powder into a cat food can and then get it into my good old electric furnace. I unfortunately couldn't fit all the powder into a single can so I figured I would have to do two runs. Anyway with the can now nicely in the furnace I turned on the heating and waited. The process that I am carrying out here is called calcination and similarly to before is just a simple thermal decomposition making a molecule of carbon dioxide escape out of the calcium carbonate turning it into calcium oxide. It occurs best at around 1000 degrees celsius however at first I set the temperature a little lower to burn away all the residual organic matter leaving behind pretty much just pure calcium carbonate. It turned out I completely underestimated just how much trouble will this preheating step cause because this white chicken gas was now being created and smelled just dreadfully. <coughs> oh, Jesus. Despite doing all of this in a fume hood the smell just didn't care and stinked up my whole lab for days. Anyway at some point the gas ignited which thankfully negated most of the stink and when it stopped being emitted almost completely I sealed the can with a brick and cranked up the temperature. After about an hour the whole thing was glowing red from all the heat and now the calcination reaction was hopefully occurring I let this thing run for a couple more hours and then let everything slowly cool down overnight. When I came back now it was time to recover my incinerated remains of unborn baby chickens and I hoped that I could easily just pull out the can but it turned out that it got insanely brittle from all the heat and I had to really struggle to get its contents out. The burnt eggshells should now be almost completely composed of calcium oxide but I had this weird feeling that only a part of them got converted. That's because they had two distinct colors and I suppose that only the white bits fully reacted. This situation was almost exactly analogous to the sodium carbonate one and I now knew that to ensure a complete conversion I had to stop playing games and use some real power. By that I mean my large gas powered metal foundry which should reach much greater temperatures than the electric furnace. I got all the partially converted eggshells into a special graphite crucible and incinerated the hell out of them for a few hours which left me with some much whiter product now definitely composed of calcium oxide. I repeated the incineration step for the rest of the eggshells and in the end was left with a pretty satisfying amount of some homemade calcium oxide ready to be used for the next reaction.
I again transfer it in a ziplock bag to my other lab, and now to make sodium hydroxide, I have to first turn my calcium oxide into calcium hydroxide just by combining it with some water. Before I began, however, I weighed my calcium oxide, and it turned out that it weighs around 500 grams, meaning that the incineration step got rid of a ton of contaminants, and this stuff was hopefully pretty pure. However, I again had this weird feeling that stuff might go wrong. That's because calcium oxide slowly absorbs carbon dioxide from the air, reverting back to calcium carbonate, and since it sat in this bag for like a month, I was having some doubts. I could potentially lose hours of my work just because I waited too long, but honestly, I didn't care, and proceeded with the reaction, hoping that in the end it will all work out. To start, I inserted a thermometer into the calcium oxide to later monitor the reaction's temperature, and then added 160 milliliters of distilled water, which I calculated to be roughly enough to react with all the calcium oxide. Now, this reaction, in theory, should produce an insane amount of heat because it's strongly exothermic, and indeed, after a while, the temperature started rapidly increasing. That meant that there was at least some calcium oxide in there, and I was really happy that I didn't have to do the calcination step again. At one moment, the whole thing got so hot that the water started boiling, which really shows the dangerous nature of this reaction. And it's honestly quite interesting that not so long ago, this water volcano was just some normal eggs. Even though I added just enough water for the reaction to fully occur, most of it escaped away as steam, halting the process. To fix that, I added in some more. I also tested the pH of this mixture, and it is now strongly basic, confirming the presence of calcium hydroxide, and meaning that my whole egg-based process worked flawlessly. The mixture's temperature was constantly hovering at around 95 degrees Celsius, meaning the reaction was still taking place. Also, in the end, I decided to add even more water to turn this thing into a kind of slurry, which in theory should be easier to work with than a wet powder. Everything ended up looking like some hot concrete, and now before making my sodium hydroxide, I had quite a dilemma. You see, I originally wanted to filter and dry this paste to obtain some pure calcium hydroxide, but from my previous experiences, I know just how painful filtering calcium salts is. On the other hand, I could use this slurry right away, which would certainly reduce my product's purity but save me days, and honestly, this second option was really appealing to me. Okay, so to start making the sodium hydroxide, I dissolved all my previously made sodium carbonate in an arbitrary amount of distilled water, and to start the reaction, I just had to mix it with the calcium hydroxide paste and heat everything up. That's at least how it should go in theory, because I read somewhere that concentrated solutions of sodium hydroxide can inhibit this reaction from happening, so I opted to carry it out in a more dilute solution, which meant that I had to use a second beaker. I split the paste pretty much equally between the beakers, and then added roughly half of the sodium carbonate solution to each of them. I didn't need to be super precise here, because I was using a very large excess of calcium hydroxide to ensure that everything reacted, since I didn't know exactly how much I had. With the sodium carbonate solution added, I mixed both solutions up and got them onto my trusty electric stove. I always use only half of it, but now I could use its full potential, and I gotta say, this thing just rocks. It's incredibly robust, can consume a gigantic amount of power, and heat up so much it nearly melts, and that's why I love it so much. Anyway, I kept heating the solutions for a few hours to ensure a complete reaction, and it felt like I was running my own egg-powered sodium hydroxide factory. When I felt like the reaction was done, I turned off the heating, and now I had to filter the solutions, and this time there was no way around this. I didn't want to waste literal days doing it traditionally, so I came up with this beast, which I call the Amateur Filtration and Evaporation System 3000. It has triple gravity filtration power, and even comes with a way of concentrating the filtrate right away, which will save me hours of time. To start it up, I filled all the coffee filters with the reaction slurry, and turned on the hot plate and steering. This whole system actually worked better than I expected, and after just a few hours, I was left with about 400 milliliters of some pretty clear sodium hydroxide solution. Apart from that, I now had a ton of this calcium paste, which I theoretically could use for something, but in the end, I just threw it all away. Anyway, to get my sodium hydroxide, I now have to remove all the water from this solution, and here things start to get a bit tricky. 
You see, sodium hydroxide has this really annoying property of being incredibly attracted to water, making it nearly impossible to just crystallize out like a normal chemical, and I had to come up with a different approach. First, however, I wanted to clean the solution up a little, because it still had some insoluble junk floating around, and I did that by filtering it through a regular coffee filter, which didn't clean it up perfectly, but good enough for my purposes. When I was done, the filter got incredibly crumbly due to exposure to the solution, and this really showcases just how corrosive sodium hydroxide is. Anyway, now with the solution ready, I concentrated it down a little through evaporation. This step also probably contaminates it a little, because at high temperatures, sodium hydroxide slowly eats through glass, and some sodium silicate will always be present in the final product, however, this shouldn't be too much of an issue. When the solution got to about 200 milliliters, I let it cool down to room temperature. Even though it should be nearly saturated with sodium hydroxide, none of it crystallized out as I expected, and instead it started to quite weirdly climb the walls of the beaker. To get it out, the only feasible way is to just boil away all the water until the sodium hydroxide melts. However, this molten sodium hydroxide would completely obliterate any piece of glassware, so to carry this out, I had to use this old paint can. To start, I filled it with the whole sodium hydroxide solution, and got it onto my electric stove. I then cranked up the heating and after a while the solution started to boil. A cool looking crust of sodium hydroxide also started to form on top of it. After about half an hour, everything got much thicker and green for some reason. To keep the heat in, I wrapped a ton of aluminum foil around the can and not much later the sodium hydroxide completely melted. This meant that all the water was now gone and after getting this thing off the hot plate, the entire green mass quickly solidified into a solid brick. Now, I had to work fast, because the dry sodium hydroxide was quickly absorbing water and carbon dioxide from the air, reducing its purity. I got it out of the can using a hammer. It was visibly impure, but that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Now, before I could use it in the next reaction, I had to crush it, which I quickly did using a mortar and pestle. I then transferred exactly 40 grams of my product into an Erlenmeyer flask, which will be the vessel for the final reaction. I then weighed the rest of my product, and it all weighs 66 grams, which corresponds to a yield of around 34% from sodium carbonate, which is honestly quite good for such a weird process. Okay, now for the final reaction in this whole synthesis, I will have to carry out an alcohol-catalyzed magnesium reduction on my sodium hydroxide to yield the precious sodium metal, and this method is pretty much the only good yielding amateur lab accessible one. It was developed over many months by a fellow chemistry YouTuber Nerdrage, to whom I am very thankful because he basically made this whole video possible. Anyway, to start I got 28 grams of finely powdered magnesium metal and added it to the sodium hydroxide. Now, the catalyst can be a number of different alcohols, but by far the best and most accessible one is menthol. It's responsible for the sharp minty flavor present in many foods, and is often supplied in the form of these pretty crystals. For the reaction I am going to need about 3 grams, but since it's just a catalyst, the amount can be much lower if you want to sacrifice a lot of time. After adding it into the flask, I now had to get a solvent for this reaction, and for that I chose just some cheap mineral oil. It's really inert and has a high boiling point, which is exactly what I will need in this reaction. I added about 250 ml so to the flask, and for the last ingredient I had to add some lithium metal, for reasons I will explain later. It can be also substituted by sodium, but this would be a little counterintuitive, and you can easily get pure lithium foil by dismantling a certain type of battery. I added two batteries worth of it to the flask, and now with the mixture ready, I could start the reaction. I assembled this neat contraption necessary for everything to work, apart from the aluminum foil insulated reaction flask, it consists of a hot plate with a thermometer to supply the required high temperature and steering, as well as a gas bubbler filled with mineral oil to monitor the progress of the reaction, since it will be emitting lots of hydrogen gas. To start, I turned on strong string and heating, and after a while, some gas started escaping into the bubbler. This was just some residual air, along with hydrogen created thanks to the previously added lithium metal. Its purpose is to dry the entire reaction mix before it gets up to temperature, because for the sodium to be produced, all traces of water and oxygen have to be removed. Lithium also protects the flask from being eaten away by molten sodium hydroxide, which is really cool if you ask me. I let it do its job for an hour at around 180 degrees Celsius, and when the hydrogen stopped being emitted, I got the mixture into a different flask due to issues with steering, and when everything stabilized, I turned up the heating to about 210 degrees Celsius. 
when the flask got to temperature, the real reaction started to occur. In it, the magnesium reduces sodium hydroxide to sodium metal, itself becoming magnesium oxide, giving off hydrogen gas. The menthol is what makes this reaction possible at this temperature, because without it, you would have to burn everything together, which isn't even close to ideal. Anyway, I let this thing run overnight, and before proceeding further, I have to quickly tell you about an online chemical supply shop, BM Chemistry. They sell many chemicals, glassware and lots of other stuff, so if you are interested, there is a link to their page in the description. Anyway, when I came back, I got really disappointed, because somewhere throughout the night, my steel bar ceased operation once again. This meant that not everything reacted, but hopefully at least some sodium got made, and to see if this was the case, I allowed everything to cool down to room temperature and drained away most of the mineral oil, leaving behind some black material hopefully containing the sodium. To separate it from the slag, I had to boil this mixture in a solvent called the dioxane, which allows the sodium to float on top, leaving the slag behind. I got a random amount of dioxane into the flask and set this thing up for reflux. After just a few minutes of boiling, I could see some shiny sodium blobs and I was just ecstatic. This meant that this whole challenging project was a success and now I just had to get my sodium out of the flask and clean it up. To start, I disassembled the reflux and allowed everything to cool down, which made all the sodium solidify. I then strained everything through a kitchen sieve to remove the dioxane, because I can easily recycle it by distillation. I then picked out all the sodium bits from the slag and got them into some mineral oil. I could stop here, but I wanted to turn all my sodium into a single large bead. To do that, I got the whole beaker onto a hot plate and melted the sodium by heating it up slightly. Now, to coalesce everything into a single bead, I had to remove this nasty crust, and I did that by adding in a tiny amount of isopropyl alcohol, which after a while made all the sodium really shiny, and now it was able to freely coalesce together. It eventually all turned into a single beautiful blob, which I allowed to cool down and got it onto a paper towel to get rid of all the oil. I then quickly waited to see how much sodium I managed to make, and it turns out that after all this struggle, I got 6.32 grams of nearly pure sodium metal, which corresponds to around 27% yield from 40 grams of sodium hydroxide, which is quite bad, but just how cool is that in the end, everything worked out. This sodium is probably a little contaminated with lithium from the batteries, but this shouldn't really affect its properties. And speaking of those, sodium being an alkali metal is incredibly reactive and quickly tarnishes by just being in air. It is also incredibly soft and can be easily cut with a knife, revealing its metallic luster for a while. When it comes to storing it, it needs to be kept under mineral oil or other inert solvent, otherwise over time it's going to all turn into sodium hydroxide. It can also turn into sodium hydroxide by contact with water. It's so reactive with it that upon contact it quickly melts and emits tons of extremely flammable hydrogen gas. It can also easily explode, spraying small burning drops of sodium everywhere, which is a real hazard. Sodium metal also has many uses, mainly in the laboratory, as an incredibly strong reducing agent. It reacts even with things like alcohols, producing hydrogen and a corresponding alkoxide, which also often is a really useful chemical. I could talk about its uses and interesting properties for hours, but this video is already way too long, so I will have to explore the more exotic properties of sodium in the future. For now, I have to thank you all very much for watching this rather large and complicated project. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, you can like it, share it with a friend, and subscribe to my channel. If you are feeling extra generous and want to see some content unsuitable for YouTube, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, special thanks go to all my wonderful Patreons for their support and making videos like this possible. And see you guys in the next video.